Hi, I'm Lisa Ambjorn, and you're watching the Permanent Rain Press. Hi everyone, it's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press today. I'm so happy to be joined once again by Lisa and Bjorn. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. I know we were just talking a bit beforehand that it feels like a very full circle moment. Around two and a half years since we first spoke, just after season one came out. So to be able to talk about the final season is, is such a privilege. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. It's it's a honor to be back and to actually have time to sit down and talk through everything. It's going to be brilliant. <laughs> I know, I know a lot of people, myself included, are excited to hear what you have to say about some of those, you know, character arcs and just what went into the final season. But to start off, I know you always imagine this story in three parts. Did you make Netflix aware of these plans? And was there a constant discussion about your vision and end goals? Uh, no, <laughs> it's the it's simple answer. Um, basically, I don't think any, uh, any shows really have the privilege to kind of decide beforehand how many seasons they are going to do. Um, mostly because it is down to, uh, you know, the numbers of viewers and, um, whatever profit the network is making out of your show. Uh, of course, like we had the discussion of, you know, when you set out, when you even write the first pitch, um, there is so much that goes into it. You're trying to get everyone excited about it and, and see all the possibilities and things that you're going to do with it. So, of course, I mentioned, you know, things that would happen later on that we wouldn't be able to fit in the first season, but questions that I wanted to bring up and just to rally everyone and, and to feel like there's so much to tell here. Um, but we didn't have like, um, like you're never sure before the season is released and about, I think a month afterwards, like Netflix particularly takes, like makes the choice if you're going to get another season. Uh, so it is as nerve wracking and I'm sure it is for, you know, even for amazing shows like Succession and I mean, even like Game of Thrones, like I know obviously they know that like so much money have been poured into it that they are probably going to get to keep it going but it does depend on on the success of the show and i mean for that we uh, have to thank everyone like yourself and and all the fans who who watched it and debated it and made netflix aware that we we wanted to continue <laughs> and that they would watch it's definitely a lot of, like you're mentioning, the engagement does make a difference. So I know when, you know, season one came out, there's just so much noise about it and talk on social media, on Twitter, or X specifically. And it's it's good to know that these fans made a difference. And for you, it's always, I'm sure, very kind of nerve wracking, interesting thing, because you think that without any kind of guarantee, it's hard for you to make some of these creative decisions behind the scenes. I know in season one, you said that you did kind of put a lot into it just because you wouldn't know if you would get that season two renewal. I was, I was terrified uh, during the first season. Um, it did feel like a really strong ending, but, but it, I mean, obviously now that everyone knows where I wanted to actually end it, you can see how far off that is from the first season. So that I was terrified then. And even in, in season two, you know, there are no guarantees. And we are also in a recession uh, that's obviously felt in the film and TV series industry right now. And uh, like before, you know, I, I knew we had the green light for each season. You, you're just like sitting there crossing your fingers. But the thing that I do that I have to do for myself is that I just continue working like it's gonna happen and i did that on season one as well even before we pitched it when i like committed myself and was like okay this is what i'm gonna do next i have to think like this is gonna we are gonna be shooting in a few months like that's the mindset i have to have because otherwise i think i kind of run out of fuel and i think it also helps um inspire the rest of the team and and especially my episode writers to kind of have this feeling like we are not just writing to please the network to let us have the show on air, but like we are writing 
or like life and death <laughs> like this is this is it we are going to shoot tomorrow what are we going to put in there um and it does help me with with kind of keeping the fire going even when you doubt yourself in what you're doing <laughs> I mean, I'm so happy that you got to see the story play out, how you envisioned. Uh, I did have a question or two about season two, just because we didn't get to talk about it previously. Um, I know your role has only gotten larger since season one. You've been able to actually be on set, play an active role in production. Was it an easy transition for you moving from sick to young royals or were there aspects and adjustments that you had to learn and adapt to? I think what was good, uh, even if it was a really hard time on season one, uh, where we had two productions going with the same production company, with, which also means that, you know, they are spread thin. Um, everyone is working, like no one is, you know, sitting in the office waiting, being able to step in when something happens. Um, what was good was that I kind of, got to do a lot, lot of hands-on practice with sick being very like because because it was covid i had to i had to be on that set because i was more needed at like the presence there but the biggest difference from the different season is like with young royals is just how much i was on the phone or not like either i was having you know 20 phone calls a day from the young royals shoot sitting and rewriting the scripts at the set of sick uh, but on the third season, I could actually physically be there. I, I wasn't doing another project at the same time. And I could just like have the talk, like have the talks just happening organically in the room, which is um, very much easier because uh, you see the like if there is a problem, you see it. You're standing in front of it with everyone just going, OK, how are we going to solve this? And it's very different then you being like disconnected, not really, you're trying to understand like, okay, is it a problem with getting this actor to this location? Is the location too expensive? Oh, the, the sun disappeared, it started to snow, like you can just handle it. Um, so in one sense, in an emotional sense, it, it, it wasn't a big transition. And I do think there is a huge need to, when you're doing these stories, even if we were only doing six episodes, by the way, I would have loved to do 10 episodes, but that's also another part of the discussion. It's like, if you sell a series that is six episodes, you don't change it in the second season. <laughs> you have your amount of, of time um, and it's budgeted for that. Um, but it, it it was more like, uh, oh, now I lost my own thread just because I, I, I start talking and then I get lost and you know this. Uh, <laughs> but it was more about um, maybe like, I'm trying to think of the biggest difference. With SICK, we had a really small team. It was It's very easy to maneuver. If you need to change something, there's so few people that you can just like easily just like, oh, actually we have to shoot that direction instead. And everyone just like sorts it. The difference with Young Royals and Netflix is that there's a huge team. Um, so you have to be more, it has to be much, much clearer, kind of the chain of chain of command. Uh, you can't just like, you don't have time to like go and talk to each and every one and to sit down and have that discussion. Um, so you have to find ways if, in to involve yourselves uh, with each other and each other's processes. Um, so of course I've learned so much throughout these years. Like I feel like I'm a different human from when we started, you know, in, in the sense of like me as a colleague. Um, and also practicing, you know, uh, taking that full on responsibility for um, the, 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 the overall storyline throughout three seasons is also something that I haven't been able to do before. Uh, I've only done like first seasons, so it, it's crazy. <laughs> so every season is like, oh, what's happening? <laughs> I am sure you are a good communicator, but if anything, I'm sure that this process also helped you kind of be more, you know, clear in what you're looking for and, and what you want, because like you mentioned, like having to go back and forth with a lot of different people to to ask for things, it's it's a learning experience and you got three seasons I also wish you got 10 episodes but like you mentioned it's now in the future you're like okay I know I need to pitch for 10 episodes from yes. the get-go <laughs> yes definitely oh god yeah but it's very comfortable doing six episodes uh in, in one way it's pretty easy 
Um, but no, I, I could definitely have done uh, 10 of each each season of Young Royals. Oh, four, four more episodes worth of these character stories. I'm sure people will probably hear this and be like, well, this is what we missed out on Netflix. But I mean, we are happy that they renewed it, of course. Um, in season two, for lack of better words, and I will preface this and say like, this is kind of what I think, what some of the ramblings I've seen online, but a controversial addition was the presence of Marcus. When you're writing him, can you expand a bit upon the purpose of Marcus in the story and in particular in Simon's life? Yeah, uh, absolutely. The funny thing is previously when I mentioned like th that there was things that I was pitching for the network, you know, when we were even starting with the first season, uh, Marcus was actually in season one from the beginning. Uh, and it, like, cause I wanted to kind of, I've, like I've said before, the first thing you do when you pitch and when you try to like sell the idea is that you just pull everything together. Uh, I would say it's like similar to uh, Jesse Armstrong who did Succession. Um, he told me, you know, like when they pitched it, they had, you know, um, no spoilers, but I, if you have to watch it. I can spoil it now. When the father in the family dies, that was supposed to happen in the first season. But then you keep putting it off because you realize like, okay, this is the, the dramaturg, like this is the motor. This is what we need this character to continue. Or you kill someone off because you realize, oh, actually we need this to happen at this point to set these characters on a journey. And with Marcus, um, he was meant to be working in the staples uh, from the beginning and uh, slowly becoming this interest for Simon uh, because I thought it was really important that when uh, Simon, and I'm going to try to say Simon because I know the fans get angry when we say it in English, but it's really hard to switch <laughs> between the languages. <laughs> um, but when Simon like um, falls in love with Wilhelm and and falls in love with a prince and is trying, trying to navigate this what royalty means and what this school means and what privilege means and everything. Um, I really wanted to have a mirror for him in someone, in a person who was more closely to his own uh, like li living situation that he could potentially have a relationship with, walking hand in hand, you know, down the street, going on dates without someone filming you, um, having that kind of normal life so that he would have like a counter to Wilhelm um, just because it was part of the theme and on like, and, and what, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you, you know, willing to do for a relationship, for love, for yourself? What, what parts of you are you, can you let go of to please others, you know, or whatever. Um, so when we started season two, and it's also important to point out that I did write the storyline for season two before season one came out. So I wasn't even sure that we were going to get another season. Um, but when we started with that, I knew, of course, like people are going to get so mad <laughs> because they they don't want anything to mess with with Wilhelm and Simon. Um, but I also felt it was important and with, with in line of what we are trying to do in our story. Um, this idea that some people watching uh, Villa and Simon have about like the purity of their relationship, the purity of their love, the, this idea that there is one person out there for you. And if you just find that one person, you'll have the perfect relationship. You won't have to, you know, you won't do any mistakes. They won't never do any mistakes. You won't miscommunicate. Uh, you won't hurt each other. And everything is pure and you don't love anyone else the same way as you love this person. And you can't have had sex without with anyone else because that would like, you know, make this other relationship less pure and less romantic and less beautiful. I felt it was important to just show that like, well, like you're a teenager, you're exploring. And even if you kiss someone else and even if you try something else like with someone, it doesn't take away your feelings for someone else or and and they and they can be simultaneous simultaneous and that's what i wanted with marcus and um one thing i did pick up from the from the fans that i hadn't really thought about because i do think we see very different things and that's what's beautiful and everyone have their own opinion 
but it's the first scene with the karaoke in season two when when Marcus is um, singing with Simon. Um, and some people kind of interpreted it as when he goes like, oh, this is uh, Simon Eriksson, Bjarstad's own, uh, you know, famous singer or um, his line. Some people interpret that at, at him being like, um, oh, he is famous because of the sex tape with the prince. And I was like, oh, no, that's not what he meant. <laughs> like, um, it's it's a small town. Yes. Um, did it become a big thing when this uh, rumor about this video that I had leaked in season one came out? Yes. But in my mind, I had really spent so much time trying to be in uh, Villa and Simon's head when the tape came out in season one. Um, so I was being like, okay, what would actually happen if that ha happened to me? And I was living in, in, in the, um, in the part of Stockholm that I'm living now, would people on the street actually recognize me, uh, even if they know me from school, et cetera. And, and, and like, would they connect me to that person? Um, and I was like, well, actually, um, uh, as soon as Villa went out and said it wasn't me in the video, in my mind, I was like, oh, and then the rumor just died. <laughs> Not necessarily in Bjarsta, but Simon became, he's not interesting anymore because the public is talking about that he's only interesting in relationship to Villa, which is the sad part as well. But I was like, okay, so that rumor kind of died down. Now it's just like in Bjarsta, they, most people already know Simon is queer in Bjarsta. Like he's he's been open for a very long time. So they are like, yeah, okay. Oh, so it was just some other random kid then at that school. Who cares? Like, yeah, the Hilishka kids, whatever. So in my mind, I was like, <laughs> you know, he's just back to being like the one person that there was once this like video of him making out with someone. Blah, no one cares. Um. So I understand then that uh, a lot of fans felt differently about that scene. And I was like, yeah, if you see it from that point, he is very manipulative from the start. And that wasn't my, my intention. But I mean, people are have the right to, to think and feel and add their own baggage into whatever storyline we make. And I do have to say, I think one of the confusions, um, conf like the, there was a big confusion about me and uh, Rojda and uh, Edwin did an interview during season two with Netflix that was recorded like two months before the release or something where they weren't sure when this video was going to be released, if it was going to be released before the season came out or afterwards. So we were like, okay, if it's released before or like on the day of the release, we don't want to spoil anything. And they were also like, so get people excited about this new character. So when we spoke about him in that interview, we obviously, when they were like, do you think they're going to like him or uh, hate him? And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're going to hate him just because he's in the way. Um, so it, it was also a lot of, I think, the people who follow us, the others who are going to watch this interview, to be fair. Um, might have understood it kind of how like pretty differently from how the experience was from our point of view uh, <laughs> of the whole market situation. I do appreciate you sharing all of that, like just adding some perspective and clarity, because like you mentioned, I mean, everything you do is intentional and he was meant to be brought in sooner than he was just kind of to add some contrast, but it's, it is good to know. And I think sometimes we forget that these these characters in particular Wilhelm and Simon they're so young and there's still so much life for them to explore people for them to meet although this obviously this relationship and this bond that they share is something special it's not uncommon for people to go out and meet other people and have other feelings and, and that's just life and so I did want to ask did you have any plans to bring back Tommy for season three, even like in just a cameo? Um, we actually did. Uh, and it was really sad. We had to cut it out uh, because of time. And there was so much going on in, in that scene anyway. We, we It was so hard in the edit. Tommy is like the loveliest, loveliest guy. And I think he's an amazing actor. Um, I hope I can uh, work with him again. Um, but I did want to bring Marcus back uh, I mean, he does come back a little bit in the beginning of the season where, because this is also something that I had in mind, 
uh, pretty early on because I was like, I want someone who could speak or accidentally say something to the press when Simon and, uh, and Simon and Ville come out and when they're suddenly public, I wanted there to be like a threat or like a, a, a feeling of a threat at least. So I was like, okay, so if he've had another person that he's either dated or at least slept with or uh, hooked up with or who he has been together with, then he can understand like how it then is you that you become so vulnerable in these situations also to mirror both what maybe eric uh, eric went through or what villa is going through or what the queen has gone through this idea of like if you open yourself up to people if you let people in they can become a threat to you when you suddenly when you're on that level when people are interested in your private life and they can mess up a lot of things for you intentionally or unintentionally and he does in season, in the beginning of season three, we, we understand that he has said something to the press. And I actually wanted to kind of show later on that he didn't, that they, like, he didn't actually say anything. They had just been calling him and he had been like, I don't want to speak to you, like, like hanging up, hanging up. And then accidentally saying something like, you know, oh, this is super problematic about the situation. But they, them quoting him as that being said towards Simon and Ville. So I wanted to bring that in um, and we tried to get, get it in. We had it in the script. Uh, we shot a little bit of it that we thought maybe this is enough to kind of understand that and to understand that like, yes, he is really manipulative uh, towards Simon in, in season two when he's, you know, when, when Sim he's not listening to Simon when he's trying to break up with him. By the way, based on an actual event of one of my team members from, from their uh, teenage years when they were like, I was trying to break up with this person and they just wouldn't let me. So we like stayed together and it was horrible. <laughs> like, and I was like, Oh my God, it's so stressful. <laughs> so we wanted to bring that in and, and um, yeah, kind of just show the vulnerability that the situation he's in and that anyone can really people, People can say stuff that actually know things about you, but people can also lie online, which is what happens to Simon later when when someone is just like spreading rumors and saying, oh, I live in this town. His dad is a town drunk and just starts explo exploiting, you know, the situation. I, I think even if we have very little time to show that, it, it, um, that's what I'm trying to bring into it. Um, so maybe not just justice for uh, Marcus, but... Uh, um, at least like seeing the full human who's maybe just longing to have a boyfriend and that makes him a really bad boyfriend just because he's not listening to the person he has feelings for. Uh. <laughs> I think sometimes, yeah, you just, you almost try too hard, right? To hold on to things that aren't there. And I'm sad we didn't get to see that cameo. As you mentioned, Tommy, such a, such a nice guy, but it it's interesting because like you mentioned the idea behind that scene that you wanted was that even he can be misquoted like just due to the the situation him maybe constantly being called now for a personal side for you like, I just want to ask how has the negativity and criticism at times affected you on social media well I do think it's um I mean it's interesting that uh, I knew that we were going to bring this up in this season because it also has been a little bit of like a learning curve to get a little, little hint. Uh, I mean, like in comparison, like I know now, you know, I, I'm i 99% of everything that everyone writes to me is like the loveliest. I, I feel like I don't deserve the love that people are giving me. And, you know, like the vast amount of like... Uh, praise that I'm sometimes like I that is really not on me like but great thank you um so the very very small percentage that I that I have seen and, and that I am uh, like that is directed towards me has kind of made me just yeah get a little bit of a glimpse into how it is when people uh think they have an idea of who you are based on a few uh, videos online and your social media presence. And it has been important because it's made me, I think it's made me kinder <laughs> towards others and, and more forgiving and more underst un un like understanding 
that we really, really, really don't know what others are going through or um, the truth behind something. Like, truth is very subjective. Uh, and I do think it's interesting with social media how our brains are not, um, you know, not developed enough to understand and to be able to comprehend the vast information. Um, it's like we're talking, we are sitting in like, 50 years ago, you would be sitting down with your best friend and being like, oh, actually that bitch, like she doesn't deserve that, blah, blah, blah. Like you would say all of these horrible stuff, but it would kind of just stay within your little friend group. And now you are doing that, but in a public space where you can also reach people. Um, and I think, I think some of the things that I've been criticized for um in like handling social media or or how to talk to the fans has also been a, a a learning curve like firstly in sweden we're not used to getting this kind of recognition for any shows really or for anyone to be even interested in what we do to be fair so um it's both that and in the beginning i was obviously like i had um twitter and i, I was on insta and, and i would kind of answer dms and i would have it this kind of like very i could like joke with the um with, with the fans a lot and we would have this like banter and they would joke with me and we would like send each other funny stuff um and I kind of soon felt I knew that like oh there's gonna be things in season two that people are not gonna um like there's gonna be a bigger divide um it's very easy to um uh, just love the decisions that uh, Simon and Villa makes in season one which is also you know part of the storyline what we wanted to do it's like we're setting up like this is what it could be like this is what they could have and then we are going to go out and explore that and it's not going to stay oh and they just keep on being great at communicating whatever we throw at them they are great at it you know we're going to explore that we're going to see how far away from each other they can go before they are you know pulled back together and I think after season two um then it kind of started to trickle in some like um some maybe more like negative views but it's still so little and it's also like I don't mind people have the right to criticize whatever they want really to be fair in the show and and feel whatever they want to feel about the storylines and and the decisions we've made what I do think is is um, a bit scary sometimes is the way that people speculate about things that they have no idea about um, and especially then when it's about Profession, like the professional relationships between us, our colleagues, or how I am as a writer or as a boss or uh, as a colleague, uh, or how how we are as friends, and and not necessarily towards me, but more that I see it towards my colleagues, and that I just feel that is um, not great and to, to witness sometimes. So I have really. Uh, stopped using a lot of social media like you know like I've deleted some of it um, I no longer search for like the hashtags of young royals because I do like I like the fandom I want to explore and see what they talk about and I think it's really interesting but I do think there's a very small percentage that um, kind of uh, speculate about the show in a way where I feel like this is not something that I want to spend my free time reading and then I now know how to avoid that. But I mean, I have to, to be fair, give them also a, a big thank you for the few people that have been writing really <laughs> mean stuff. It's also like, you do learn how not to care about it. And I think that is a good lesson to be in this industry because as soon as you put something out, people are gonna have opinions and some of them will already have made up their mind about what they think about you or about the show or about the characters. And there is nothing you can do to change that. There is nothing you can change. Like me sitting here talking now, it's not going to change anyone's mind. And it's not my intention because it's impossible. So you just have to let people uh, feel what they feel and and um, know just when to uh, not search for it. Well, for those people, Lisa thanks you for helping her develop thicker skin. But like you mentioned, it's something you don't want to feel like you have to answer for. Like, you know your experiences and it's just not worth the time and effort. So I do think it's great that you've been able to kind of take these breaks and, and delete some accounts for, you know, your your health and your mindset. And 
Um, well, later on, I'm sure we'll get to some tweets that where fans are much more lighthearted. But I wanted to talk about music because you co-wrote Seaman's song in season two and then Willie's song in season three. Tell me about your decision to be involved with the music and the creative process behind it. Yeah, I think as soon as we um, kind of, as soon as I started working and I knew that Simon was going to be in the choir and he was going to do music, the first season it was, it was like, okay, what songs can we put in there that the choir can sing that are interesting and, and, and that kind of builds Simon's character, but also that are just cool to hear in the like choir version. Um, but then I knew that like, we're not going to be able to just have like just like it being like and every season we have a choir performance where Simon sings the solo and it's another pop song you know like it was like how are we going to find dynamic in that and obviously Simon on his journey to kind of with the music and that being his voice and and, and that being very very close connected with with where he is right now emotionally um and so, I mean, it, and it just so happened that when, when I started to write season two, as soon as I had written like, oh, I think Simon is going to uh, do a, a version of the the, the Hilushka song. Um, I was just like, oh, I should speak to Magnus, our music supervisor about that, because he had also arranged the choir during season one, because he is like a, a composer and he has worked with a lot of choirs, which was amazing for us to have that both as our music supervisor, but also having that skill set. And it, it was with him that I wrote the original Hilerska song, which I also wrote with him. Um, so I was like, we just started talking and, and I was like, OK, can we have I want a, a slower version. I want it to be like um, I sent him like an email like this is what I want it to be about. I will write some lyrics. I'll send it to you. But we need to find like um like um in in like I, and I'm not sure what it's called in English in moll it's like a not the kind of happy sounding accord like chords but like depressing accords <laughs> and like how can we make this into something else and then we just started working and then we wrote it and it was a bit like oh um of, of a of a shock that it went so well and that it it, it also reminded me because I was in a band when I was a kid I my dad taught me how to play the guitar when I was like twelve. There was always loads of music instruments at home. Uh, he would have this little tiny studio in a wardrobe where he would sit and write music, my dad. And I was in a band when I was 16 and we wrote our own songs and they were horrible. Like at the time I was like, oh my God, like it's so embarrassing to play this. But then when I listen back to it, I'm like, it's actually very cool that we dared to do that. And I guess that's the journey I wanted to put Simon on. Um, and so in season three, when we were like, OK, so what is his journey going to be this season and how are we going to work with his voice? Um, I was like, well, it's time for Simon to write a, a song from scratch and it has to be about what he is experiencing right now. Um, and I had written in the script like he writes his own song. It's about the. Uh, uh, about th this like feeling that he has with suddenly everyone caring about him and Villa and people thinking they know him and you know in the beginning like stand up for yourself don't take no bullshit um, if they want a revolution let's be one like F it you know uh, <laughs> but then to have him kind of revert into being like actually should we have to be a revolution I don't think we should and like you know what like this has still meant so much to me and like you and me you were my revolution to Ville and I hadn't written it so like and it, it was oh, I was we had so much to do that the process with the music kind of was left behind so so when we were going to record record that scene with Simon singing it I had written it like a week before that and we hadn't Put the music down and I play guitar and I wanted it to be on piano because uh, Omar plays piano better so I was like it was it was a whole mess and I think that's kind of set it up for it being um, a bit of a struggle in the beginning but I'm very happy with the end result and for the people who are like oh it was so cringe I'm like yeah yeah that that is supposed to be <laughs> what you're experiencing especially when he's alone in his little room and trying to um, because it is, but it's also really brave of him to just be like, 
this is my heart and I'm just putting it out here for all of you. And you can all stand there and scream at me, you know, and I think like even like the, the title, like the, uh, when he sings uh, the arc song in the very first episode in season one, um, that's what that song is about, you know? So it, it's something that lives with in with him being like, well, you can like, okay, let them laugh, let them laugh at you then. Like, I don't like, I'm still going to be me, you know? Um, and I, lo I love the final version. I think it's beautiful. I listened, I, I like, I couldn't listen to it for like the whole editing process. I was just crying when I heard Omar's voice <laughs> singing it. Um, cause it was so beautiful. Um, <laughs> I mean, it always helps when you have someone like Omar to sing it with his angelic tone. But like you mentioned, it's not meant to be something that's super polished. And so yeah. I think it, it probably took some understanding. Like, how did you work with Omar to get to that place of comfort and understanding, especially in the context of the story? Because like you mentioned, maybe it was a bit of a struggle. I know that both Edvin and Omar, they weren't initially happy with it, but obviously they can say that now that they've trusted yeah. the process. And I think I think it was actually my fault that we <laughs> that 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 story even came out because we were asked about it in an interview we did together, and they asked like, "So Willis song, it was so amazing. Tell us about the process." And and uh, but Edwin and Lamar was like very like diplomatic. Started to be like, "Yes, it's." And I was like, "You know what?" I was like, "They actually hated it in the beginning because I also think it's important to kind of show to people that." I mean, for me, it's very important that my colleagues feel comfortable enough to also say when they don't like stuff or when they think something is bad or um, when something isn't working for them. I think that is um, super important. But you also have to remember that when we come into set, when we come into rehearsal or when we are in you know, pre-production or post-production, people come in with their everyday life from the outside. They can be stressed about a lot of other things and the outlet for that can be something completely different. You know, like that is something that I have learned from doing three seasons to just because someone comes in and say, oh, I don't, I don't understand why I'm saying this. And I feel really stressed about this, this scene. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go in and solve all the problems for them that they are having. Maybe they are just tired and hungry and they would just rather today go home and sleep. Like, it's fine. You can be annoyed. Um, we'll get through it. We'll find we'll find our way anyway. So I've kind of like accepted a lot of my, like, that my role is to be like this, like, you know, just very this sturdy person who just stands there and say, okay, I understand that you feel like this. Can we make any changes right now that would make it easier? Blah, blah, blah. So that's what we did with that. And at, with the process with, with working with Omar, I mean, we did the version in, in the room, which I also think he had a, a struggled when he was shooting it, but we showed him the scene when we had edited it together. And he was like, oh, actually, it looks very nice, like it does sound nice. And I think that's also a reassuring thing for him because because he has his music career, for him it's obviously intertwined with what happens in Simon because he puts so much of himself in, into him. But we have to stay very like divided in like this is Simon and this is Omar. And he wants it to sound great. He wants he wants Simon to make a great song. Like for him, it's just like I want him to do something great. And I mean, they did, um, I think we did get a few uh, suggestions from the, even his production company, maybe, um, or record company with some songs, but it didn't really work. I rewrote the songs a few times. We kind of changed the music around it to just uh, show that it would gonna be a good pop, pop like piano tune. And then when he went into the studio, um, it was uh, Magnus uh, Linnea Roxheim, who was whose episode the song was going to be in, in episode six, who's the uh, director, and me in that room, um, and the, of course the studio people and everyone. And we just started working with it, and uh, he just found it. Like, and, and we were also working with the tonality of how he sings. We wanted it to be very fragile, you know. Simon coming home early in the morning after that night with with Wilhelm by the lake and just you know kind of singing kind of quietly into his microphone at home having all of those emotions and and 
Omar just got it and and started to experiment and felt really comfortable and you know can I change that word of course can I you know I think it was the last um uh, where he sings um oh my god what what does he sing now uh Jag hoppas att du når dit. Uh, he sings. Uh, he like he we like changed one of the last 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 lyric things so that he felt like oh that that's what he would sing there you know, um, and and I oh for var du he sings like um, th that you can be you in the end and it it worked really well so it, it's for me it's that it's like just trusting people and and this is also my job people are nervous around me all the time like. This is not going to work. We're not going to, are we actually going to feel what we're going to feel here? I mean, is this not going to be like super ridiculous? Like my job is to be like, I see your worry. We're going to do everything we can to incorporate and do it beautifully. But also just stand there and take it <laughs> when people are worried. <laughs> I feel like for you, especially with your vision, like that's something you you have to do. It's like stick with the path. And obviously, though, you want to be accommodating where you can and be collaborative. So I'm glad that you you got to that place. And I do think it's a really important song in the context of where Simon's head is at at that time. Uh, you and the writers, the script team, stayed consistent in this final run. How has it been conceptualizing ideas with this group over the past few years like how have your writing sessions and relationships really evolved I mean I do think it is fairly unique to get to have the same episode writers for three seasons and add just add in new ones I don't think I, I don't know any other production that I've had that uh, for three seasons I don't know if I will ever get to do it again because it's such a privilege to have you know, the same sturdy group, but then also let like the new writers emerge from that and get to um, come in and be an episode writer on an episode. Um, like Tio uh, Boguslav, for example, who got to be an episode writer in, in this season. Um, he was my editor, uh, script editor in season two. And for that to happen, it also means that everyone else gets to write less episodes and that they get less money. So it's really, really speaking highly of the group of people that I've had around me that they are willing to take a cut in their own paycheck to let someone else emerge. I think that says a lot about them as people and as colleagues. And um, it has been absolutely amazing I don't think you get to know each other as well as you do in a writer's room in any other situation because you have to when you're trying to convey okay but I think we should go this way wait is this character more like this or like this you have to bring up experiences yourself you know I was in this situation and actually this is the role I was given in my family when we were, grew up like you are so um constantly like talking about yourself and your experiences um, and so much of it makes its way into the show in one way or another. Um, and they all, I mean, yeah, it, it, they have been like, they have been an anchor for me as well. I think feeling so, um, so much trust in that group. And I think sometimes when fans are like, oh, you could have done this, or you could have done this, or why didn't you think of this? I'm like, trust me. We have talked about literally, and it's it's so crazy when you do that. When you talk, the way you talk around the scripts with everyone and getting feedback from everyone constantly for months and months on end, and you change things. Like, I'm like, we, we have tried a lot of different things. <laughs> and to have that trust, to know that they were coming back season after season after season, um, and actually, we sp I think we also spent less and less time together in the writers' room as the season, like as the seasons pro progressed, because we all know we what we've had the, the talks, and that is also something that is very cool to be able to do. Um, and also saves a lot of, and, uh, ironically, saves a lot of time because everyone has already heard me 
go on and on and on about this particular thing. <laughs> so then when I go, actually, we're going to do that. We're going to put that in this episode. Everyone else is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know what you, we know what you're on about. And everyone outside is like, what? We need to discuss this. And we're like, no, no, no. We, we had this discussion two years ago. Let's go. <laughs> um, and also to add the, like, um, adding more queer voices in the room, uh, setting up writers that are going to go out and write amazing uh, new queer stories after this. That felt really important for me as well to really accommodate that and to make sure that, like, the legacy of Young Royals will be, you know, also that all of these people are going to come out and do amazing stuff afterwards um this has only started you know kind of that's great that you can kind of be a bit of a launching pad in that sense for these creatives and and offer them a safe space and I love that you had that trust to be able to you know challenge each other and really push boundaries in in storytelling and it's great to see that by season three you know you were just really confident in the decisions that you made and these past conversations that you had even like two years prior so in terms of you know the the plot points and the storytelling the presence and loss of Eric was very strong this season take me through that creative decision to revisit his past at Holerska and have it be such a big recurring factor for Wilhelm, August and Queen Christina this season? Well, I think this is also something that was very early on. I mean, this is the first draft I wrote of the storyline of season one before we pitched it to Netflix. Um, I wanted to bring up the kind of... Um, uh, the traditions that these school have and and how some of these kind of uh, panelistic um, situations have kind of evolved. Uh, also, like what the modern version of like this hazing is or can be. And when we even when we did the interviews, one thing like we, when we researched season one, before we had any team members and we were just like sending out people interviewing others uh, and I was interviewing people. What really surprised me was there was a big amount of the experiences that people have had at these boarding schools um, that have, you know, been there just like in within the last few years um, who had been through pretty traumatic stuff at these schools to some extent. Um, uh, some of it being hazing rituals, um, not necessarily very physical, but but very um, you know manipulative or or very like um, scary just because you feel so isolated, um, and they still were like, oh, I I had the best time. It was the best thing. Oh, I love those years. And there was people who we interviewed who had understood that they were queer when they went to these schools. So they were living at these dorms and they were knowing that they were queer and they never felt that that was a safe space enough to come out. They felt like it would be impossible for them to come out. And they came out many years afterwards, some of them. Um, and they still said it was the best time. I had the most amazing time. And for me, that was such an interesting thing that like, okay, so you, you oppressed yourself. You, you, things happened to you that were violating your freedom. And still you loved the uh, camaraderie and you loved the feel, the school spirit and you felt like you had such a connection with your peers. And that for me was like, oh, that is very interesting. So I had this idea early on that Eric would have been part of that kind of system, of the hierarchic system, and, and that he would have been part of something that was going to come out later on. But I obviously knew that I wasn't going to be in season one because then it was going to be, you know, overshadowed by the fact that he had actually uh, died. And um, when we were doing season three and I knew like, OK, now it's the time and place to explore this and to bring this out. I was happy that we had set him up as being very happy with the school. Um, towards Wilhelm so that there was no like surprises in that for Wilhelm you know it's not like when we see Eric coming to the school the first time he's like "Ooh, actually I had a bad time here no he's just like this was amazing um, maybe because he was the perpetrator in the conflict that came out but also because he obviously 
along the way, he's also a victim of just being put in that system of uh, the idea of um, masculinity, the idea of um, of uh, uh, what a Hillerska person is and what they do to each other and, and how hierarchies can be good or, or whatever. Um, and it felt like it was really nice to be able to mirror the experience that Villa has coming to terms with that, seeing that in his brother, this image that he has built in his head, and especially after his dad. I love the conversation that Ville has with his father when his father kind of misunderstands what Ville says, because Ville asks, like, so he was he was perfect. But his father takes that as a statement and just says, oh, yeah, he, he was really, he was amazing, you know, like, so it's it's breaking down this idea of, like, how would he have seen me and I, and it's also built on my my friend who who's um uh whose father passed away when she was a kid and and when she got older she heard that he was actually quite homophobic and she she's queer so it it kind of clashed with the idea that she had about her father and having villa mirror the realization that Eric wasn't perfect and, and that he was also a part of the system, both the victim and a perpetrator maybe. Um, and to have August kind of revisit his own memories and dealing with um, maybe why he thought it was okay in the first place to film another student. Even if we're not talking about posting the video of Wilhelm, which is obviously done out of spite and, and wanting some kind of weird revenge um, and illegal, uh, but but just the idea that he was filming. I was like, where did that come from? Who who set up the kind of notion that, oh, you can joke, like, oh, if you see them making out, like, take a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll all laugh at it. You know, like, even if it's a straight couple, ha ha. Like, the idea of like nothing is private here. Like we all can like we all have the right to like take the piss of you, um, and then at the same time having his mother actually going through, um, actually letting the loss finally hit her for real, and her not being able to actually deal with that. Having done everything prior to that, kind of just in a in a way of like distracting herself almost being like, how are we going to treat this? How are we going to, okay. Media wise, how the, the funeral, what flowers are we going to have? You know, like just, just going into proper like organization mode and then it actually dawning on her what has happened and how that has messed with her and her whole idea of reality and her family and everything. Um, it just felt like the right way to kind of like, get all of the emotions together surrounding that and just like tie the knot <laughs> it did its job obviously i think for for viewers we were shocked but like you mentioned that you had this idea churning from the first season like especially being immersed in that class system and hilerska and how that can affect you like you mentioned sometimes your your actions like you don't have to be at the core a bad person but a lot of it is system based and and being involved with that so with the queen like what specific illness does she have because it wasn't ex explicitly said in the show no and i think that th that was uh, that was purpose like that that was the purpose of, of not being very explicit but i do think in in um what what I've said to everyone is is just that she she has an exhaustion diagnosis. That is what she gets. Um, her symptoms are are similar to like M M E and and similar diagnosis, uh, which has also to do with like um, long term chronic stress, uh, which is something that I think that she has been under f long before Eric and everything, but that now kind of comes to, you know, a very philosophical moral question in her mind <laughs> like like everything coming together and i just i've seen people gone through that and because i think statistically it's still more non-men who gets diagnosed with it um it's something that is still kind of a bit like frowned upon like we know it's very common that this happens and people you know it takes them a few years to come back into work life or or whatever 
but I've seen people up close going through that and it is really terrifying. And especially if, if you're 16 and your parent, that, cause that's also what I want to mirror um, between Wilhelm and his mother, uh, Chris, that Christina, even if she has taken bad decisions before and hasn't heard him and ha hasn't, you know, catered for, for his needs, it's also safe for him that she's the same. Like no matter what happens, she will be like, hands on, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sort it like this. And then when she fails to do that suddenly, when he really needs, maybe he needs her to just be the like, yes, this is not going to be a problem. You're going to, you know, like we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Kind of Farima has to come in and take that role. Um, but it's really scary for Villa to see his mother kind of just like not remembering things. Like it's really scary when you see a person at, shift that has been so like powerful before and they just lose it. it it makes you question everything so i just wanted to explore that especially because it's it was it seemed to be both physical but also mental so like you mentioned it's still his mother and to to see her in this new state where she she does kind of shut off um, at times especially like in in the birthday dinner scene and that is something that's alarming to him and it does start to weigh on his mind as well would you say that you are hands-on in the process behind the scenes or do you leave a lot of the creative control to your directors uh, well I, I think when you think about creativity I think we sometimes think of it as being a singular thing like who is holding the kind of creative torch in in this moment but it, it's actually not something that one person is having like everyone is in it and everyone is just like morphing around uh figuring stuff out i think especially this season i had sat down so much with the directors and had talked through the scene so much and being able to take all of their ideas and thoughts and creativity creativity into the scripts and also other departments we had really good suggestions from from like wardrobe and from set design and from our lighting team and from our camera um our dops so like it did feel um like we very much knew what we were going to do when we went in with certain scenes and then it can be a question of someone going oh actually i want to can i throw that down can i you know pull this chair out can i scream when i say this line and obviously that is, um, you know, the director's job to have that conversation with the actor and, and also be able to understand that different actors have different needs uh, direction wise. Uh, and so during set as a, a showrunner or a head writer and an executive producer, I just usually sit by the monitor Um I usually listen into when we read the scene through before we uh, go in to a scene, uh, try not to answer a lot of questions, try not to, um, because also what happens is that everything is already there, um, you know, in the script, but you also have to let people go on that journey themselves. If you just sit there and go, oh, you're gonna feel this, oh, in that moment, you're thinking about this, maybe that's not helpful for that particular actor. Maybe they actually don't want to think about what has happened previously. They need a physical impulse to be able to, you know, go where they want to. Um, so it's really just like one like organic thing like that is just like happening between me and the director and, and everyone on set and the uh, the actors. Um, and I also think it's important though for everyone to feel like, can I try this at least once? Absolutely. And I usually say that to the, to the directors, if they get a strong sense like in a scene that like, oh, actually, should we not end on that person or should we, should he just not run out or I need something to happen in the middle. Either I come with suggestions or I just go, okay, you know, we'll do what we have written and then try whatever you want and we'll have it and we'll see when we come into the edit what we need. Um, for also for everyone to feel free uh, to explore, uh, you know, and, and take, and also take the things that they do the best into the work we do. And if you just go and sit and say, no, I, I don't, we're going to do it like this because I've thought about it a lot. It's like, yeah, but now you're in a room with people who maybe haven't thought about it. So you need to, you know, let them have their process. <laughs> 
Exactly. So you you are always there to be a sounding board, but you don't want to, you know, be the person with all the answers, essentially, to say like bottom line, which I think is great because it, it lets people, like you mentioned, have the freedom and allow them the creativity to, to try new things that may work and may not work, but it's all part of the same continuous process. Mm-hmm. Uh, this season, it dealt with a lot of damage control for both Hilerska and the monarchy, and it took its toll on Wilhelm and Simon in, in different ways this season. With Wilhelm, his was more or less, I think, expected, given what he's been up against the past couple of seasons and the emotions that he's held in. But with Simon, he's been someone a bit more comfortable in his own skin, aside from a brief portion in season one. So take me through having him feed into the negative comments Mm -hmm. and the hate that he's been receiving on social media against his better judgment and against Wilhelm's pleas to to ask him not to do that as well. Yeah, I think that's actually a key line when Wilhelm uh, says to Simon, like, um, well, you you search the you the, don't go searching for the hate. Sorry, it's me like translating the Swedish lines into English in my head, but it's like you, but you're searching for the hate. Um, with all of our characters throughout the entire entire show, I've been very very clear that we are in their subjective point of view. We are not, you know we as the viewers and as the camera we are not like the truth like in some shows you'll see you know like you'll see different things happening but but the camera will be like telling you like what is actually happening um we are not doing that we are telling you what the characters are feeling and how they are perceiving the world and what's happening to them and and taking it very seriously and what we were talking about before with like social media and hate online my tiny experience with that, but also seeing cast members and other colleagues on other projects, like in the US, who have followings of millions and millions of people. Even if you you have you have two million followers and two and a half, no, one and a half million of those love everything you do, and they put up hearts and they say you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing. The rest of those say this like 2000 accounts that are out to get you and they post everywhere and say that you're an absolute disgrace and, and write all of these horrible things about you. Th- that happening when you're 16 um, can feel like those one and a half million other people don't exist. And that's what I wanted to explore with Simon that when the video came out in the first season, it was such a shock. And it was such like it was a speculation if it was the prince, if Simon was the one who was with him and, you know, the press trying to talk with him. But they hadn't really come to the point of like questioning him in the same way. Um, Everyone wanted to know, is the prince queer? That's what they wanted to know. Is he hooking up with a boy? What does this mean for the monarchy? What does this mean for the future of the, the state and everything? And now, suddenly, when things are going well for them, they get to be together. The speculations are are about him and their relationship. And, you know, that messes with his mind because he has not experienced that before. And it is, unfortunately, something that Villa is much more used to. So, uh, and, and Villa is also so busy with everything else going on. And I know that people have been like, why don't they just get like Simon... Um, um, what, what is it called? Like a press, uh, no, like a social media like strategy. Why don't they teach him how he should handle his social media? And I'm like, you know that like all of our actors had like a day like that before season one, and it still doesn't mean that you never get into saying the wrong thing online or people being mad at you for, you know, like... Unfortunately, it doesn't mean that you're suddenly a perfect, like strategic and know how to handle yourself. Um, so I just wanted to be like very, very clear on that it's finally here getting to Simon because it's suddenly so, 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 so personal. It's not about his sexuality, and it's but it's about people writing about his dad, about his family, about racist stuff, about 
um, and people lying about that they know him. And even if he, because when he posts the video, there is like loads of like cute comments coming up being like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is amazing. And he gets really like happy. Like he's like, oh, you know, I'm going to change something. And the little boy who asked for a photo on, on the 1st of May, like that feels amazing, but it doesn't feel amazing enough to kind of overcome the 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 hate that he does see um and he gets into a vicious cycle of feeling that which is also something that i've heard people say and that i've kind of felt in the beginning when we suddenly got a following on on um, instagram and so on this feeling that like you can control it that you can somehow if you just keep your eyes out and know what people are saying you can control it and you can't and that's what he learns but it is his subjective experience. It's it's not saying that the whole world is hating him. They are not. Like, they are not, in fact. Um, like, Farima says it in the car with Wilhelm in the very first episode. She's like, you know, oh, you're going to make a lot of people become royalists. Like, you're going to... Uh, this can actually be a good thing. So, obviously, there are a good, like, things happening as well. But Simon just can't see it in this moment with the pressure going on. What's really sad about, you know, this whole arc with the social media is that music's always been a safe space for him. So it's kind of sad to see him losing that that joy that he had, you know, in season one when he's kind of just singing by his by his keyboard for fun. Throughout the season, we can also see with Wilhelm and Simon how their actions made a part affect who they are when they come together. A lot of tension, a lot of lack of communication. Why was it important to show them be at this like impasse and, and place where they can't really meet and see eye to eye? I think I felt very early on that this was the most interesting part about their relationship it was important in season one to set up what we were going to hope for with them and what we know that they could have um but then also to explore uh first in season two okay can we actually make it without each other can we actually just forget this and and try to go our separate ways no we can't we have to be together okay and what does that then mean um the few encounters I had with upper class people when I was a teenager, I still remember to this day. Uh, the conversation that they have with uh, Rosh and Ayub and, and Stella and Frederica and uh, Henry and Walter and everyone by the uh, fire or the lake in in, uh, in uh, episode two, uh, it's like straight out of of my real life. Like not the prince parts, but like the way of the way of not finding each other. Like. Um, classicistic wise coming from different classes and what it actually means and um how blind you become to your own privilege when you have it um and i think i would have felt like i lied if i just said okay yeah there's not going to be any uh, tension or issues or problems with their communication um never not in the beginning not in the middle not in the end not when they get older i think it's interesting to have conflict and to find a way out of that conflict and um i know that there is viewers who maybe would just hope for a kind of more of a heart stopper story uh, with these two boys um and i'm really happy that heart stopper exists uh, and that it can be that for a lot of people. But it also, of course, I mean, from the beginning, if you watch season one, it, it, it's no heart stopper. <laughs> like, it, yes, they are good at communicating maybe uh, to some point, um, but it, it, it's not perfect. And I do want to say that, like, I do think it's interesting. It was an exploration. Okay, but can they be together? If you are so different, if you have such different backgrounds, can you? And I think it was very cool to get to explore that. Like, I think you can, but you have to bump heads and you have to figure that out. And I think from, if you talk to older people who have been in longer relationships as adults um, and you come from different classes, oh, there is a lot that happens there and a lot that you need to experience and learn about yourself and see in your partner to be able to develop as a human being. And if you can find that you 
like love each other in that that's beautiful but also i think there's an, a narrative right now online being like a perfect relationship is a per like is perfect like perfection actually does exist and that people who make mistakes or uh, in periods in their life become bad at communicating can't express themselves don't know how they're going to handle certain things it means that they are in somehow not worthy of sticking with or fighting for or or getting help or you know whatever it is that they need and I, and i think it's uh i just don't think that's i don't, I don't know anyone who has like a perfect relationship i know people i know a lot of queer people who have a lot of amazing relationships um like you know so many good like role models <laughs> but it doesn't mean that they haven't had really rough times in their relationship and i think that makes it more beautiful if you can get through a rough patch <laughs> and and figure yourself out and grow as a human <laughs> it's definitely something that I think it doesn't seem like it should be linear. I mean, if it is good for them, but like you mentioned, and there's, there is something interesting and there's something that can come out of moving past a rough patch and, and strengthening that bond. Can you expand a bit on Wilhelm and Simon's intimate moments this season for you as a writer? Like, how do you add these in being considerate of where they are in the story, but also in the back of your head, knowing that there's a bit of fan service aspect in that as well? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I knew in, I knew that it was going to be like considered maybe uh fan service this season because they get to be together and they don't have to hide and they don't they choose not to hide in school anymore and they make out in the hallway etc um but i mean that's just if you just look at the pro progression of their relationship and, and what they've been through in the previous two seasons obviously that's what, what where they are going to end up and i do think it was very important uh for example their sex scene in the end of episode three and uh, that was very important for me uh, to have in there and it was also a conversation uh, Jared Carlson who directed that we had really good conversation and how we shaped that scene um, it was something that was at one point in the script process asked if we could take it down uh, from the network uh, like actually not show that they were having sex and we felt and, and advocated very strongly uh, that we have seen straight sex in the season before. So we do have to, uh, we do want to see uh, the queer sex. Never meaning I myself, I don't like expl like things being too explicit. I don't think you need to show, especially in this kind of show, like a lot of skin or you don't have to, you don't have to shock people or, or to eat, not even, not even shock, but just like, you don't have to, be like it's exactly what we see that we are gonna you know like you, you can be art artistic about it just like we are you know with the choir singing during their scene and it's beautiful and it's about what's happening on the inside but apart from that i was very very keen on getting to be very romantic and getting to have i think what a lot of people long for and and really 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 um wish for in their own life and on screen which is that sparkling giggling i can just like put my finger next to you and suddenly it feels amazing and i can look at you across the room i mean that kind of romance is so like it's such an amazing feeling and it usually doesn't as an adult you know that maybe that part of the relationship doesn't like last for <laughs> very long <laughs> uh but it felt really like beautiful to be able to just like go into that and and yes it was a question of like where do we put it because we don't want to like over we don't want to completely like ruin all of it by having it so often that it it, it doesn't feel special when it has happened um and i think some people maybe interpret interpret it like uh you know 
oh, so they argue, but then they're suddenly like close to each other. And but do they, do they only want to have sex with each other? I'm like, absolutely not. But they argue, they have a conversation and then you put your arm around someone and you're like, oh, I actually want to put my head on your shoulder. Like, it's about that, the constant tension of like uh, the romantic feelings you have and, and the wants and needs. And also the reality of it is that you have like a shit day, something bad happens. It's your everyday life. You argue, you have a fight and then you you know like you make up and you get to like kiss you on the cheek and you get, get to giggle and it's all that like lovey very fluffy yeah just making people feel amazing when they watch it and I think you do like it throughout the show like I loved watching people when it when like watching my friends when we were when it premiered I would like look over at them as soon as they got to like hold hands and everyone is like oh like <laughs> Oh my god and it's so warm and and nice to get to be in that and be reminded of when you have been in that or where when you felt that and um and it's not no problem really i mean we had a fantastic intimacy coordinator this season marlin who it was so easy it was so fast and and they are so uh good now at understanding how we work when we do intimate scenes so everything feels so safe and and relaxed and very very clear you know like everything is uh you know choreographed down to the very detail but at the same time having that lust and and like you know creative flow when you do it it's you know that's the magic and i know that we have that and that we can work with that so that's obviously like makes it very easy to write <laughs> i love that you fought to include that scene having that that butterflies in the stomach kind of feeling like you mentioned and i think it also just calls back to their age and and how everything moves you know so quickly for them and they're acting on impulse and on feeling have you had discussions with Edwin and Omar about their characters comfort levels and confidence with each other physically and how that's progressed like were you on the same page yes I think that's the simplest answer this yes we were on the same page and I think they were just when we talked about the seasons um, overall, and especially season three, uh, when we had done two seasons already, when they read the scripts, I actually had no questions from them about the scenes <laughs> uh, in, in that sense. Because also I think they are very good, like with their impulses and, and their knowledge as actors, um, you know, they put so much into their characters and and into their collaboration that they um they very instantly felt like oh now we're at this point and and we're here and we're we're gonna you know be at this level and should we have a kiss like you know they can come with you know suggestions they're like oh it feels like I would just like kiss him fast on the lips here or or we wouldn't kiss but I would like put my hand on him you know like they can come with suggestions as well I mean Obviously, intimacy, when intimacy occurs in a scene, it's because it changes some of the actions or it's telling something about the characters. But they were very, um, no, very easy, comfortable. No, had no discussions about it, if I'm honest. <laughs> to all those watching, you can catch Young Royals. Season three is out on Netflix and we will see you next time. Bye.